Well, thanks so much. And thank you all for joining uh, us today. And uh, I'll be talking about snoring and obstructive sleep apnea, which are super common. Um, certainly nothing anyone has to be ashamed about because you'll see some of the estimates out there are very common uh, problems. And from a surgical standpoint, which as you'll see is certainly not the only treatment out there, it's been a little bit of a, a niche thing. It's been the focus of my entire career. And it's uh, exciting to say that we're you know, one of the world's leaders in this field here at uh, Keck and USC. And certainly if any you know, patients have any questions, any people interested in seeing me, email, which is really actually the best way to reach me, it's, it's right there and I'll put it up at the end of my talk as well. So part of being sort of, I guess, at the forefront of new developments in the field is that I work for a number of established uh, and startup companies and even has some of my own crazy ideas. The only one that has relevance to our talk is the fact that we receive some research funding from a company called Inspire Medical Systems and I'll be talking about their product briefly towards the end. I'll talk you know, general terms about snoring and obstructive sleep apnea to, to put us all on the same page and go through the various treatments that are available and then specifically focus a little bit on what we do uh, in terms of the role of surgery and treating patients with snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. So snoring is, you know, it's hard to put a definition on it, but, but effectively it's noise that's created during sleeping, usually from vibration of things inside our throats often it's vibration of the soft palate, which is the area in the back of the roof of our mouth. It's really sort of a vague thing. And honestly, they're not really great measures of quantifying the severity of snoring. So, you know, typically we have people come in the office and you say, oh, how bad is your snoring on a zero to 10 scale? Of course, people will say, how do I know I'm sleeping? But, you know, obviously they, they talk with their, their spouses or others that might have heard their snoring to give them a sense of how bad it might be. But one of the great things about smartphones is that there are a number of apps that are out there. And the one that's probably the best is listed right there. It's called Snore Lab. There is a free version, uh, but there's the paid version that you can use every night for multiple nights in a row. It costs like five or $10. We have no financial interest in that app, but actually it's a pretty good way for someone to gauge their snoring and get a sense of their snoring if they don't have you know, someone <laughs> that's sleeping close to them at nighttime. And certainly for, uh, people to provide evidence to someone who is snoring that actually it's, it's pretty loud and there's something that's going on at nighttime because it does record snoring and it gives you a general sense of how loud that snoring is. And honestly, I use it when we have different things that we do, simple stuff or even procedures, we can actually monitor their snoring severity over time. So in general though, for snoring, the main consequence is what we call behavioral. It's a disruption of sleep really of others. So it's, it's not the, necessarily always the person that snores, but it's the others that are awakened because of the sound of their snoring, except snoring can also be a sign of something a little bit more going on, this condition called obstructive sleep apnea or OSA. And in you know, medical terms, it's the symptomatic repeated upper airway obstruction occurring during sleep. So it's that people are trying to breathe, but they're having blockage of their breathing and it's producing symptoms and occurring repeatedly during the night. The severity is quantified in a sleep study, and I'll show you a little bit more about that later. And there's something called the apnea hypopnea index, which is the number of times per hour that someone has blockage in breathing. It, they're up to five times an hour, which sounds like a lot, but it, it's actually within the range of normal. But people can have different degrees of severity, depending on how many times per hour they're having this blockage in breathing mild obstructive sleep apnea being five to 15 times an hour, moderate being 15 to 30, and severe being 30 or more times per hour. So every minute or a couple minutes throughout the night on average. And so the consequences of obstructive sleep apnea can be behavioral also, meaning sleep disruption for the person who actually has the problem. Certainly not everybody with obstructive sleep apnea has their own sleep disrupted, but it certainly can be. So they can wake up and even though they've had their eyes closed the whole night, they still feel very sleepy and fatigued and, and have trouble concentrating. But they're also, especially when it's severe, and I'll show you that later, but when it's severe, there can be health-related consequences, primarily what we call cardiovascular consequences. So high blood pressure, the risk of stroke, heart attack, or even early death. And I mentioned before, snoring is very common, but actually obstructive sleep apnea is also very common. And the National Institutes of Health estimates that about 18 to 20 million American adults have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. So this is a really common problem. And unfortunately, many people are not diagnosed. But how do we get diagnosed? 
it could be through a sleep study. Oh, here, first I'll show you that severe sleep apnea is serious. So this was a really well done study published a while ago out of Spain, looking at many individuals across many centers followed over time. And what you see here in these diagrams on the right side is that ones with severe obstructive sleep apnea, they had a higher rate here of fatal cardiovascular events, so heart attacks and stroke, and here are the non-fatal events. And so it's really leads us to say that the health-related consequences are those who have severe obstructive sleep apnea. I think a lot of people get, get a little worried if they find information from friends or even on the internet that you know, everyone with sleep apnea is gonna die in their sleep and it's so terrible, terrible, terrible. The reality is that we wanna be a little bit more measured in how we get alarmed by sleep apnea. It can be very important in terms of disrupting someone's own sleep, but from a health standpoint, we really you know, don't wanna, I guess, overstate how significant it can be, but it still can be very important, of course. So some of the risk factors of obstructive sleep apnea probably hold up equally well for snoring but haven't been studied as closely are basically it's more common in men and then in women after going through menopause. It's actually very common in young children. It's actually the number one reason that children are getting their tonsils removed these days. And it's common as we all get older, as we get into the age of being considered older adults, which I'm getting a little close there myself. As we gain weight, falling into the overweight or obese category, increased risks of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea, and then what we call structural abnormalities. So especially in children, large tonsils or adenoids, if you have a large tongue or if your jaw structure is set up for putting you at risk for sleep apnea or snoring. And then of course, if you have snoring, it's a little more common that you know gonna have sleep apnea as well as if you have other symptoms like sleepiness or even fatigue or difficulty concentrating, that can be a clue that there might be some sleep apnea going on and being something a little bit more than just plain simple snoring. <clears throat> so sleep studies, which is, are necessary for the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. We have these apps that can tell us how bad snoring might be, but to actually diagnose sleep apnea, there are the sleep studies and there are two categories of them. The in-laboratory sleep studies, what are called polysomnograms were done for many years. And what you see on the, the upper picture here is of someone being wired up for an in-laboratory sleep study where someone gets a test done in a sleep laboratory. We have them at Keck, they're you know, all over the country, have these studies available. They're very detailed and they give us a lot of information that can be very important. But actually there's been a real push to getting sleep studies done at home. And what you see here is someone getting a home sleep apnea test. This is just one of the many technologies that are available. But someone can sleep in their own bed. They can sleep more comfortably maybe. They don't provide quite as much detailed information, but it can actually be very useful and it's sort of the first line treatment for patients we were thinking about possible obstructive sleep apnea. And from a cost standpoint, because they are cheaper, it's one of the reasons that insurance companies generally prefer them. So people will often have said, oh, I don't wanna go get wired up there like the person up top, but in fact, you can get this done at home. It's a lot more comfortable for many patients. So in terms of treatment, which really are you know, the way to think about things for both snoring and obstructive sleep apnea, they fall into four categories. The first category are the behavioral measures of the conservative approaches, including weight loss, avoiding sleeping on your back or in the supine body position. So you ask people to sleep on their side or their stomach, and then avoiding alcohol or other sedatives, especially within about three hours of bedtime. I tell people who want to have a drink completely fine if that's what they prefer to do, but have, try to have your drinks with dinner or before dinner, not so much after dinner, almost like driving a car. You want the alcohol to be out of your system. For many people, the first line treatment, and really for most people, and certainly my own practice, the first line treatment for obstructive sleep apnea is CPAP or other forms of positive airway pressure therapy. And what you see here in the upper picture is basically the machine, and this is just one of the companies, but you have a machine that's effectively an air blower. And what it does, it blows air through a tubing connecting to some sort of mask. And this is a mask that goes over the nose, but there could be masks that go over the uh, nose and mouth together, or masks that actually tuck inside the nostrils a little bit but you have this sort of headgear and the straps that basically hold it in position during the night. And the way it works is by blowing air in, it effectively balloons open the throat a little bit so that people can sleep and they can breathe. And it really can work very well for taking care of obstructive sleep apnea. It's something that, because I'm board certified both in otolaryngology as well as in sleep medicine, I order CPAP all the time. I think it's a fantastic option for many patients. The challenge is sometimes it doesn't really work well and people can't sleep comfortably with it or it doesn't clear up their sleep apnea completely. 
And so we think about alternative treatment options, including surgery and oral appliance mouthpieces. And down here, the bottom is a picture of one of the custom-made kinds of devices, typically made by dentists, but basically they're made with a part that goes on your lower teeth and a part on your upper teeth. And the way they work is they effectively hold the lower jaw forward during sleep. They can work well for the right kind of patients. And part of what we do is we, you know, when we evaluate people who don't do well with CPAP, we think about the full array of choices and, and why someone might be a great candidate for one of these mouthpieces or maybe a mouthpiece in combination with the procedure to really get the results we're looking for in terms of treating their sleep apnea. But again, what I do is, you know, a lot of what I do is surgery. And so the common role of sleep apnea, of surgery, I guess, should be in those who have snoring that's not responding to those conservative treatments like weight loss, sleeping on your side or stomach, or avoiding alcohol within three hours of bedtime. And then for those who have sleep apnea in adults, which is what my practice is, adults who are unable to tolerate positive airway pressure therapy like CPAP. And that's about a third of all patients who get positive airway pressure therapy just can't get comfortable with it. So for them, you know, they have obviously the options, those conservative treatments, and sometimes that's enough, but with that's when we start thinking about surgery or these oral appliance mouthpieces or even a combination of the two. So from what I, you know, what I do uh, and what I explain on my website listed there is, is to think of surgery, it's what we call an anatomical treatment. It's, it's almost like a plumbing problem that we want to figure out what's causing someone's sleep apnea and figure out how, what we're going to treat them. And so there's quite a bit of research that's been done showing that effective surgery must be directed to the site or the sites of obstruction. And by that, I mean, if this is a side view drawing of someone's you know, head and neck area, we want air to be coming smoothly through the nose here and then going through the throat and into the lungs. You just heard a great talk from Kevin Herr about how we treat nasal blockage. And that can be a very important part for snoring and some patients with sleep apnea. But even with snoring and definitely with sleep apnea, we often have something going on in the throat. So we need to think about treating what I call the palate region. So the area up high in the throat that includes that soft palate, the, the back of the roof of the mouth of the tonsils. And this overlapping area basically behind the tongue, which is shown here, and the area a little bit lower down in the throat, what I just call the tongue region on my website. And so really what we do, and it really been the focus of my entire career, is how we figure out what's the cause of someone's sleep apnea to really guide us in selecting uh, procedures or even mouthpieces that can really help individual patients. And so we've got this wide array of surgical treatment options. These are just the ones that are for obstructive sleep apnea. There's even others that are available for snoring. And really, I, I always uh, get, a, get a, I guess, a, a laugh when someone talks about how they had the surgery for sleep apnea, because I think we've come a long way in, in, in the last 15, 20 years of my career and, and really have an array of options now that exist for treating patients, sometimes just in the office. And certainly when it comes to snoring, we're primarily looking at office procedures, but also in the operating room to really tailor treatment. I think a, a common thing that we talk about in medicine these days is what's called personalized medicine. And the idea is that we don't treat everybody the same way. And so we have this array of options. Some things are not so involved. Some things are a little bit more involved, of course. And we want to get the right thing that's going to work well for an individual patient. So I'm going to show you a few examples here. But basically, the question is how we figure this all out. And so with a couple of European colleagues, we've actually named this evaluation technique as drug-induced sleep endoscopy. And we've actually developed the way we look at the findings of this evaluation technique. But effectively, what this thing let's sit here, this drug-induced sleep endoscopy is, is taking this flexible telescope and Kevin showed you a video from one that doesn't bend, but this is one that, that bends. And what this allows us to do is look through the nose and into the throat. We do this in the office all the time, but in, in fact, what we care about is doing it when people are sleeping. And so I joke with my patients that I you know, show up, make an appointment, I'll show up at their home with my telescope so we can watch them when they're sleeping, but that doesn't sound very good to them or really to me. But the idea is that we can actually go to the operating room and have someone get an IV and some sedation to, so they can take a nap in the operating room. And then we take this flexible telescope to see what's the cause of their sleep apnea, where they're having their blockage and breathing in the different parts of the breathing pathway. And so we've come up with a, uh, a sense of how to characterize this and really guide us in treatment. But we've led a couple of international studies really showing us how to take this information and really use it to the best of our abilities. And I'm not going to gross you out hopefully too much by showing you a little video of the kinds of things that can occur when we take a look. And basically what we see is the space for breathing. And here someone has this soft palate fluttering around, but we can look inside while someone is drowsy and taking a nap and see what's going on. 
And so here's someone that's not so bad, but the soft palate there is fluttering around and making that snoring sound. And then there are people here that have a little bit, sort of a different pattern. I don't expect you all to be experts in this, but this is a different kind of pattern. And it really does change what we would do in thinking about treatments and not just with surgery. And so we do that evaluation and then we talk about what are options. And so not just after that exam, but just in general, we have a wide array of things that we do. And some of the things that are done in the office are the same kinds of things Kevin mentioned about treating the inferior turbinates in the nose, we can also use that same kind of technology, it's called coblation, the one I prefer, to treat the soft palate, shown right here, or to treat the tongue. And we actually do this a little bit different way than, than people around the country do. It's based on some experience of some colleagues internationally that have shown us you know, a little bit better results, I guess, with treating the soft palate with a few more spots, and then treating the tongue in the back of the tongue, the front of the tongue, the sides of the tongue. And just like in the nose, what we do is this controlled cauterization for us, it's usually two sessions. It's done with in the office with local anesthesia, anesthesia so you don't need to be asleep and pretty mild pain. And, and just like shrinking tissues up in the nose can open up space for breathing, so can tightening things up in the soft palate or tongue open up the space for breathing or make things not flutter around as much. So it can be very helpful in the right kind of patients with both snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. When we talk about sleep apnea, and we're talking about surgery of the soft palate to really open up space for breathing. The old fashioned approach was basically cutting away or chopping off this uvula hanging down to the back of the throat here and part of the soft palate. It was a little bit crude in the sense that, you know, you just cut things out. But in fact, modern soft palate surgery is based more on not just cutting things away, but also moving things around. And actually it's very little cutting away. So I'm not gonna get into all the technical details, but there's muscles that are behind the tonsils. So you usually take out tonsils if they're still there. And basically you sort of pull things forward. And if you, it's only a drawing, but if you basically pull forward the soft palate on this drawing, what you get is more space for breathing behind the soft palate. It turns out this works a whole lot better than the old fashioned soft palate surgery that is still unfortunately commonly done around the country. And it works better and actually less side effects. So it's, it's got a nice combination for patients. So better results with soft palate surgery. But there are other things that can be done as well. I mentioned the tongue radio frequency, which can treat down low in the throat. There are other procedures too. But this Inspire, and it was nice to see that someone has a question already about this, but Inspire is a, you know exciting therapy that was approved by the FDA about, 10, about six years, seven years ago, I guess now, 2014. And we were the first center in the Western US to offer it. It's a fully implanted treatment. So it requires a procedure. You place three components of the system in the body. So there's the generator, which is sort of like a pacemaker. And there's two wires. One goes to the nerve that controls tongue movement. One goes down look, to sense breathing patterns. And here's the system shown in place. And what you get is this remote control that you place over it. Nothing goes through your skin, but just communicates through the skin. But you press a start button when you go to sleep and it senses your breathing patterns and it delivers mild stimulation to the key airway muscles through this hypoglossal nerve. It's the nerve that controls tongue movement. And basically you have it on when you're sleeping and you turn it off when you get up in the morning. And it really has shown some really nice results for sleep apnea. And, and we've done some research based on that drug-induced sleep endoscopy test to figure out the right kind of patients that would benefit most from this. So in conclusion, snoring can be an important nuisance, but also a sign of obstructive sleep apnea, which is a potentially serious medical disorder. And evaluation is really the key to good results for both snoring and sleep apnea. We have this array of treatment options, starting with conservative treatments, but also including CPAP, surgery, and mouthpieces. And really that last point is sort of the, the, the base of my entire career is that we don't believe in cookie cutter approaches. We wanna really tailor the treatment to you as an individual. So I'll open it up to questions. I know there are already some great ones and uh, we'll just go from there, but I'll put my email address back up for anyone who might be reaching out. Great, thank you, Eric, that was wonderful. I'm always impressed every time I hear you speak and, and give your lectures, so thank you for that. <laughs> I'm say that. Um, yeah, the first question was, what is your opinion of Inspire? And, and um, do you have anything to add? Sure, well, I mean, I think for the right kind of patient, it's fantastic, and, and I think that, you know, there are centers around the country that, that are really doing it for everyone with sleep apnea, and I don't think it's really, that that's, you know, entirely the right thing, I think that, when I see patients with sleep apnea, we talk about Inspire and we do this drug-induced sleep endoscopy because that's actually required before people would get it. 
And we really, honestly, just last week had a major international effort of you know, over 300 patients where we looked at this test and really using everything we could get from that to really find out if you're the right kind of patient for, if it's the right kind of treatment for you, if it really benefit the most. And, and so we use our own research all the time in taking care of patients. And so we, we uh, use it for many patients and we're busy and been doing it for a while and have a lot of experience, but, but not necessarily for everybody. But, but that's something we would discuss, of course, as part of an evaluation. Great, thank you. Next question was, if I snore and have been diagnosed with a deviated septum, what are the chances that the snoring is caused by the deviated septum and that fixing it will alleviate the snoring? Great question. I think that the key in that is, uh, first of all, we treat many people with a deviated septum uh, regardless. And, and it's not just snoring, but it can be breathing through the nose during the daytime, which is very important and a reason to do a septoplasty surgery. But as far as from a snoring perspective, obviously you're only gonna know until you have it done. But, but in terms of guiding people and giving a little bit of a sense of how, you know, what your results might be afterwards and talking to them before surgery, we look at other of these risk factors that I listed. So, you know, people who don't have deviated septum, you know, men, postmenopausal women, big tonsils, other reasons being overweight or obese. Those are the things that make a little less likely the snoring is gonna clear up completely. Although honestly, you don't always need your snoring to clear up completely. You can really make a substantial improvement uh, with just treating a deviated septum. And the other big part of it, of course, is how bad the deviated septum is. I, I think that the, the mild deviated septum honestly doesn't always need to be treated at all, but it can make a big difference if it's pretty significant. And that's where you know, we often do uh, procedures together, you know, working to help patients achieve good results. Great. There was a follow-up question about Inspire. Um, the question was, what is the right patient for Inspire uh, qualifications? Um, and does insurance cover Does insurance cover it? Sure. So the, the, uh, I gave a talk actually yesterday through Inspire uh, um, about this, but there, there's a series of criteria that need to be met. And if you do meet those criteria, insurance typically would cover it. Sometimes there's some appeals involved, but actually a number of major uh, insurers now have policies where if you meet these criteria, you will be covered for it in a more straightforward way. But you have to have this moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, tried CPAP and been unable to tolerate it, not have what's called central sleep apnea, which is a different kind of sleep apnea, and basically have undergone this drug-induced sleep endoscopy test, which is required everywhere around the world. One of the things that we are one of the world's experts in it, but have had that test and not had a certain kind of blockage in breathing. It turns out it was the second kind of patient that I showed in that video, just but you can't have that. But we, we go beyond that. We, we take that video and the findings from that video and really talk in a more detailed way of whether it would be the right thing for you. And of course, make decisions, not just tell you what you have to have done, but make the decisions with you as, as you know, you're the, you're the ultimate decider. Okay, great. Uh, there was a question also about recovery time from tongue uh, coblation. So one of the nice things about uh, radio frequency treatment, the coblation, uh, both the soft palate and the tongue, it's a relatively mild recovery because everything's done under the surface. So you don't, as opposed to tonsillectomy in adults, if you've had it done or know people who've had it, it's, it's not trivial, but you know, it only lasts for a week and a half, but it's, it's significant during that week and a half. But tongue radio frequency and the coblation treatment being one of those technologies, it's all under the surface. So you don't have this raw area you don't have quite the same pain. So it's usually the first couple of days that it's sore on a zero to 10 scale, it's probably in the four range maybe, but I've had people that have had a lot less and they told me I exaggerated quite a bit, but, but it's, it's something where you feel like something's been done for the first 10 days or so, but it's something that you should have a normal diet by the next day. It's a pretty low impact procedure, which is why a lot of people like it. And certainly for the right patients, I really I think it's fantastic. Okay, great. Um, there was a, a little bit more of a general question, um, which I think you've touched upon, but uh, the question is, which treatments are available if a narrow airway has been identified as a likely cause for the sleep apnea? So that's, that's, that's uh, our wheelhouse, I guess. That's exactly what we do. So, so that's real key and the real reason why evaluation has been such a big part of my career is because that's the, the you know, multi-billion dollar question, to be honest. Um, it's something that how we figure out what's where things are narrowed and what's causing the sleep apnea or even the snoring, what's causing it to begin with. That's how we, we choose treatments, including procedures. Great. 
Um, there was a question, is there an oral appliance you would recommend for moderate obstructive sleep apnea? So the oral appliances generally work the same. They fall into three categories. The, the least expensive ones are ones you, you, you know, they're, they're buy them on Amazon or you know, buy them on the internet. And, and they're pretty simplistic, I guess, uh, but they just put them in your mouth and you're good to go. There are ones that can be molded to your teeth, almost like sports mouthpieces. You put them in hot water and you bite into those. Also relatively inexpensive. The custom made ones, which are made typically by dentists, are the ones that are a little more comfortable. And the reason why they're more comfortable is because they're a little smaller and, and you can adjust them. And so you basically start out with very little amount of moving your lower jaw forward and gradually you, you move your jaw forward a little bit more. And it's not so much dictated by mild or moderate sleep apnea. It's more based on you know, whether insurance might cover part of it, to be honest, uh, because they can be fairly expensive and also you know, what someone might offer. And there's more than just that. The, the picture I showed is one that's commonly used. It's a very nice device for many people, but different people have different, the size of their mouth might be uh, different or there, there are other reasons from a TMJ or jaw joint issues that may influence the choice among the oral appliances that are out there. Great. Okay, right, here's a, uh, another question. Um, should everyone get tested for sleep apnea as they get older? especially if they occasionally snore due to sinus issues? Yeah, I, I think if you have sinus issues, you might want to address those first. And, and occasional snoring as we get older, I mean, I think that's probably 80% at least of people over the age of 60 uh, that have occasional snoring. I think what we worry about is people that have you know, notable snoring that's bothering other people and or snoring that may be associated with other signs and symptoms. So if you have high blood pressure or other cardiovascular health issues, if you're not getting refreshing sleep and so feeling that fatigue, it's, it's basically people will often say, I thought I was just getting a little older, but in fact, it's, you know, I was really not getting good quality sleep. And so I think if it's not bothering other people, sometimes we're, we, we don't want to have tunnel vision. We want to think about people as people and not just someone who might snore occasionally. So you would address anything that was going to be worth addressing and see what might happen. And you can always get a handle on it with these many smartphone apps, including the Snorlab app that I mentioned. 